You know, he brought up about going to the conference for David and Courtney at their their church that they've been at for how long were y'all there? A long time. Ten years? Nine, nine, ten years. You know, most of us that are my age, we grew up in an age of churches where um, we're used to the denominational structure and everything was in that structure. If you were a Baptist, you went to Baptist youth camps, you went to Baptist missions, you went to Baptist conferences, uh, and you can apply that whatever. <clears throat> well, we're not a, we're an independent church, like a lot of more and more churches are. And it's neat to see how the Lord is bringing networking in and giving us all we need across independent churches and independent organizations as we listen and look for divine connections, as I call it. So Jason and Israel, through David, went to that conference with Ken Fish and uh, were highly blessed. Just It goes on and on. Monday night, I don't know who found it, but somehow or another, Israel and Jason have been going to a Monday night inner healing prayer intercession meeting from a church in Fort Oglethorpe called Be Love Company. And um, I went there Monday night just to hang out. It was so much fun. The Lord used me to bless them, used those two guys to prophesy. I got two prophecies on the way out, and it was just so interconnected. I never even met these most of these guys before. And then Joel walks through the door, and it's so cool. And then they go to a intercession group on Tuesday nights at the Rockbridge Ringgold, and it's just neat to see all these interconnections everywhere. You know, two weeks ago when Ramon's from the Dominican Republic in Tampa Bay, and then Martin is from Overflow Church down at Westside. He came and translated. We had four churches this morning. I was at Johnny Carnes Church just hanging out with them, and uh, it's neat. This is an organism a divine organism instead of just an organization. And just so look out for connections. They're everywhere. And the Lord's putting together his body the way he wants to put his body together, and it's really fun. Um, All right, we're going to start tonight. I'm not great on series. This may be a series, but oftentimes the Lord interrupts it, and I pick it up two months later. But uh, uh, eventually get through it. it is... Several months ago, I talked about the Lord wants us. God is made up of three parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want us to get to know all parts of the Godhead, to know the Father, to know the Son, and to know the Holy Spirit. And so, and then I said, we're going to talk about it. Then we've had, I never got back to it, so I'm picking it back up. But we've had a lot go on. We've had uh, Ramon here. We've had Michael Watkins here. We've had Brian speak, Chad speak, and it's all been good, and we've got 52 Sundays a year. But so I'm going to pick up, start with the Father, and talk about the Father. So let me just tell you what I do. I'm on this journey. For the rest of our lives, we're going to be learning about the Trinity. But I think it's important to know the Trinity and to know the different parts because they have different roles, they have different emphasis, they have different values. And so, all of my life, the person I've basically gotten to know the best is the Holy Spirit. And that's what came inside of us. And he's, he's called the comforter, and he's called the teacher. And, and um, I'm learning more about Jesus as the bride and wanting to learn about the Father. For me personally, this is how I pray. Remember with the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. He said, pray to the Father. So he's an important thing. He's not just off in the distance. He's not just a a grandfather type figure that you go in and he doesn't say anything. He's he's like the mastermind plan behind all of this. And they all know their roles. And so I'm in my own (coughs) walk in life being more specific. Excuse me. I may have to get some water over here. I'm getting more specific about trying to pay attention to which part of the Trinity that that I talk to. And if this is too mystical, I, I don't want to apologize, but just you can think about it. 
you know, 90% of the time it's the Holy Spirit. And I've gotten to the place that actually, when I say God, I'm referring to all three. For a long time, I just said God, and I was referring to the Holy Spirit, because that was my default. So this is just my own personal journey. If it doesn't make sense to you, you can just drop it and move on. So I usually pray specifically, should I pray to the Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit? And then if I'm addressing all of them, I just use the word God. Because it says God is three persons, one God. And that's just something I've done to try to help make this thing a personal journey. But one side of maturity in Christianity is almost a ladder. It's almost steps. And you all, if you've been around here, you've heard me talk about this a lot. Um, I think the first step is being a believer. The key word is, Lord, I repent. It's repentance. The next one that I'm not sure how many Christians get to this phase, but it's a lot lower percentage. It's become a discipleship. The key word there is imitation. Show me your ways. Lord, I want to learn and change. Just because you're a believer, not all believers are disciples. And it's interesting, he wants us to learn to imitate him. Because the Great Commission is actually not to make converts, it's to make disciples, as you read the end of Matthew. Um, another level of maturity is becoming a servant. The key word there is obedience. Lord, what are your orders? You can be a disciple of somebody. That means you understand their ways. <clears throat> you understand some of their thoughts. You understand some of their thinking. But when they give you an order, do we obey? We all want to be servants at all times. We never stop being a believer. We never stop being a disciple. We never stop being obedient. And then we could talk about all these, but I'm just trying to set it up for the for the father part. Um, the fourth phase, I think, is becoming a friend of God. The key verse here is John 15, 15. And this... The, the, that's the key verse, and I'm going to read it. But the key word is companionship. Let me read this, John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Well, I always take orders, but there's a higher level here. If we're willing, if we be a good servant and say, Father, I keep wanting more, make me mature. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So there's something even higher than servants is to be a friend. And that's where he starts explaining the orders he gives to you. We know Jesus was already there at, at age 12. You might remember the story. His family was in Jerusalem for the Passover season to give their yearly lamb for the annulment of all their sins. Lots of family, lots of cousins, lots of nephews somewhere. Jesus left them and went into the temple. They thought he was with all the cousins and nephews and friends and neighbors. But he was actually in the temple with the priests questioning them, probably teaching them about the Old Testament. I tell you what, that's one of the videotapes or the MP4 playbacks that I want to see on YouTube when we get to heaven, can you imagine a 12-year-old talking to the high priest? Maybe not the high priest, but the priest. I wonder what he was talking about. I don't know, but his family, after three days, go, where is this kid? They go to look at him, and he goes, I was about my father's business. Because that takes us into the fifth level, with the father. And that's to be a son, where it's not just father in the abstract. I am a partner, I'm a servant, I'm a friend, I understand the ways of my father, and we're building a business together. Not like a 501c3 or S corp, but whatever he's doing, I'm about that. And so I think all of us, with the entire Godhead, 
obviously want to be a believer. We obviously want to be a disciple. We obviously want to be a servant. And I think we can be friends with all three of them where they share why they're doing what they're doing. Now, if that sounds real mystical, just put it on a shelf and say, wow, Lord, do you want some of that for me? And he'll start doing it. With the Father, just the Father, I think there's a higher level. And that is to be a son. You can be a friend, uh, like, I'll well, think of a good example. Israel can be, fr- and he's an adult now, he can be a friend with Uncle Brian. Okay? But he can't be a son, technically. I mean, he, he may inherit him, but... We're not a son with Jesus. There's a higher calling. It's, it's the fifth step for Jesus is to be his bride. And so with Jesus, as we grow in these individual relationships, we start relating to him differently. We're not the bride of the Father. We're not the bride of the Holy Spirit. But we're the bride of Jesus. And he wants that level of intimacy. But the concept of son, and that's what we're going to talk about here, at least for a few more minutes, and talk about in the future. The concept of a son, Jesus is a son to the Father. It says we're, we're co-brothers. We're both firstborn. We technically, I mean, they don't get hung up on who's talking to who, but they can't, technically we can't talk, we can't be a son to Jesus. It's very clear in the Bible where his brother, where his, where his bride. But we can be a son with a father. So what does it mean in this one special relationship with the Father, to call him Son. That's why I think it's good many times to put the individual person on it. And you can say I'm a son of God because it's all through scriptures. It's biblical. But there's just something about I'm a son of the heavenly Father. And Jesus knew this at 12. He, He already knew he was a servant by then. He was a friend. But he knew the ways. He knew the Father's business. He probably carried an authority and an intimacy at 12 that blew the priests away. Now, obviously, he had, he was the son of God. But there's some things we can pick up and things we can learn there. Rick Joyner, here's a quote from him. Talking about being more than just a servant and more than just a friend. So here's the quote. Labor is cheap. Friends are expensive. Sons are priceless. Very few people start moving and thinking like I'm the son of the heavenly father. Romans 8, 15 and 16. If you want to write it down, I'm going to read it here. It's a common, common passage. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And as we, through the weeks ahead, start exploring this, I hope to to get to some of the depth of this, because as He said, I'm about my Father's business. It really is, I know they didn't have S-corporations, His business is more than just money. It includes that. But it is about inheritance. Sons are written in the will. They're going to get more. I'm not talking about going to heaven. They're going to get more here on earth, inherit more here on earth than those that just see themselves as believers or disciples. Because he's not going to turn over the father's business except to those who know the Father and the way the Father wants to run that business. Is this too deep? Is everybody all right? All right. I heard a minister say many, many years ago, a national minister, and I still think about it a lot, whether it's right or wrong. But I think there's a lot of truth to it. He says every human that's ever been born is born with an orphan spirit. What does he mean by that? 
You know, they may have physical parents, but he meant spiritually they think like an orphan. Boy, they're having a good time back there, aren't they? <laughs> Bless them, Lord. I'm happy. Need to maybe pray for Deborah in there. I wonder if she brought her NFL football uniform. <laughs> and so, I don't remember what I was talking about. Oh, orphan spirit. I don't think, I think they know, they're no, they don't, they, they're recognized as sons and daughters in that room. They're having a good time. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? It means we are born into the world not knowing our spiritual father. Adam and Eve were created. They weren't born. But right there at the very beginning, God breathed into Adam and he knew him. And they had the advantage of knowing what he was like, what his ways were, what his personality was from the very beginning. And I've thought about that. And you can think about that. It's, it's probably probably true. And so the rest of our lives, we're on a search for the Father. Spiritually, even if we can't put words to it. We're on a search for the Father. And then I started looking around and realizing how many people feel abandoned, even if they have a good household. How many people feel lonely, alienated, in isolation? And a lot of it is because they don't know that the Father is crying out as we said in, at 5.30, for the manifestation of the sons of God to be revealed. It's very interesting in Romans 1 where that's talking about. It's talking of, it's, if you read Romans 1, it is a progression of a civilization into utter darkness and chaos. You can read it. I even wrote it down and graphed it one time and mapped it. There's specific steps. And if you look at it, we are way beyond the last step as a nation. It just says it goes here, it goes here, it goes here. You can almost put decades, the last 70, 80 decades on that. And then it ends at the, you know, it doesn't matter. You can go back and read Romans 1. It talks about a decline of a nation, of a civilization or whatever they call themselves. In the middle of it, it says even the earth is crying out for the sons of God to be manifested. What does that mean? That means a group of people that realize I'm a believer, I'm a disciple, I'm a servant, I'm a friend, and I'm a son. And what does that look like? What does it mean to be about the Father's business? It didn't say He's crying out for believers. He's crying out for sons to be manifested, to grow into understanding how God wants to steward creation. There is a legitimate green movement. And one reason the green mo- there's such a big green movement now is because no Christians I, I'm, that I see rose up and said, we are to be stewards of this. Way back in Genesis 126, this is your mandate. Rule over the fish and the land and the sea. If there had been a Christian... Uh, blueprint, I don't think we might have gotten off as weird as we are now. What do you mean by weird? You, the green movement's gone way beyond being green. I mean, because some of it's legit. They've gone to worshiping creation. You know, uh, worshiping um, well, Mother Gaia, as they talk about it, and different things. Well, that's way beyond we are to, we're lords in a good way over creation. We don't worship creation. But that's coming and it's starting to happen and the manifest sons of God starting to rise up. And so I really believe that the Lord is taking us on the path. No Jesus, we get saved, start learning about the Holy Spirit and doing all this together. <coughs> but also, to learn who He is. Let me read Galatians 4, 6, and 7. It's read it earlier, but different version. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave... This is one I want to key off of, but a son. 
And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. You see the link there? You're not a slave. You're a slave. Then you become a son. Then you become an heir. And so the goal of this is not just to become understand sons, but to become heirs. Because what I've noticed, and there is this thing here, and I don't know how well I'll be able to teach it. We want to be servants, but we're not slaves of the Father. No longer a slave. You are a slave to sin. Now, I know I'm getting into teaching here, not hooping and hollering, but we were all slaves to sin. When you were born, you were an orphan to the Father, and you were slaves to sin. What does that mean? You couldn't keep from sinning, at least in certain areas. And he's wanting to go, you're no longer a slave. You might be a servant, but not a slave. Servant is voluntary. Slave is involuntary. Well, how do we get there? Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You can trust Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, it's it's interesting with the Holy Spirit. Um, He is the most... Well, I mean, that's not a fair statement. Let me just put it this way. He doesn't care if he gets any attention. He is always leading people to the rest of the Godhead. He's always teaching you how to be a bride, and he's also teaching you how to be a son at the same time. So you'll get two different instructions, and you'll go, well, you just told me how to act this way. That's towards Jesus. You just told me how to act this way. That's towards the Father. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. And we often just throw it into God. But I think it helps. But the Holy Spirit, He really doesn't care about getting any attention at all. You never really see Him promoted in any way in the Scriptures. Obviously, He's a key player. Just throwing this out. Tell you what, we'll stop there. We'll pick up next week and get into some details. Um, what I'm going to be talking through over time, there's actually a little booklet out front if you want to sort of get the cliff notes. Um, uh, I don't even remember what it's called, but uh, it's obvious when you look at it out in front. Um, so we'll just end here. I think this is a good point because I've given you a lot of thoughts. Hopefully some of them are new for you. And um, so this week, just take an action item and start going, Holy Spirit, help me to know who I'm talking to. Now, like I said, 90% of the time with me, it's the Holy Spirit. And that's biblical. He's inside of you. He's the comforter and the teacher. And 90% of the stuff I get is from him. But he's, he is constantly referring me to the Father. And that's how Jesus said to pray. And he's constantly referring to Jesus for intimacy. Let's, so I'm going to stop there. Any questions, confusion? I tried to be clear, but honestly, this kind of teaching, is there's not much of it out there. It's very, very rare. Um, but it's where I'm at, so since I'm your pastor, that's sort of what you get. <laughs> Anything anybody wants to add or confirm? All right. What did you say? Yeah, they did. They go, the two messages went together. Amen. Well, we'll pray. Then maybe you should get your kids and rescue Deborah. Although, knowing Deborah, she's probably the one causing all of it in a good way. Well, Father, I thank you for this family that I'm a part of, the spiritual family that we're brothers and sisters together that we're sons and daughters together of the Most High God, and that we're on a journey to know the Trinity like we've never known them before. And it's exciting. And help us this week to start getting even more insight on how do I not just be a believer, but to become a disciple, to become a servant, to become a friend, to become a son. What does it mean to be a son? And so, Father, we just, I just commit all, commit this week to you. 
And I pray protection over every person here. I pray for encounters with you and your word in the night and dreams through other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.